Hi there. Welcome to the Sober Circle channel. Enjoy this speaker tape. Woo! You light up my life. Oh, yes. You gave me hope when I didn't know there was any hope for me. Thank God for each one of you. I just love you. My name is Liz Bailey. My anonymity is shot to hell for a very long time. <laughs> I'm the most definite alcoholic you ever could lay your eyes on, and a very grateful alcoholic. Uh, hi, everyone. I feel so honored and privileged to be asked to come to Tampa. I'm privileged to go anywhere at 73, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it has been a terrific honor. And I want to thank the committee and Mike and Christy and uh, I can't start naming names because you guys follow me. Sober, thank God. Drunk, you wouldn't have followed me around the corner. But thank God you've been following me. Dolly and all of you, it's just wonderful to be with you. And uh, I haven't gone out and gotten anybody a new story, because the one I got here with was Lulu. And nobody has told me it's gotten better out there, and I believe you. If you can make it back here, I welcome you back. But again... I'm going to have the same story, and would you all timers and all of you pray that I reach somebody here tonight? Because that's my primary purpose, is to stay sober. And that's why I hit the road and the planes and the trains and the buses and the subways, because I want to reach someone to come into this beautiful fellowship. And we don't promote AA. We don't promote it at all. We attract you. And I love it when you all said, I want what you got, Liz. Oh, my God, ain't nobody ever said that to me, you know? <laughs> And when nowadays you're telling me, oh, I want what you got. And I said, well, I got it in AA, and I keep it in AA. Thanks to John and Beverly for being here with me again. And they're part of my life. John has been in my life for 30 years, and he's still with me. And that's another nice thing about AA. You get lasting friendships. It's so beautiful, so beautiful. Now, there was a preacher preaching. And he says, if you drink, oh, I want to thank Jimmy and Mike for coming to the airport getting me yesterday and I'm gonna tell you something real cute they was there with my name up and I went over and I kissed Mike hi Mike then I went over and kissed Jimmy hi Jimmy and there's another little fellow standing there and I said are you with this crowd he said no but I'll take a hug <laughs> so I hugged him you know so I got them all out the way right yeah. so if you near me you're gonna get it you're gonna get it this minister was preaching, and my minister friend is with me this weekend again. We've been privileged to be together quite a few times, thank God. A couple of you here this weekend have been with me before, and I've been with you. That's your heart. And, you know, um, this minister said, if you drink alcohol, you're doomed to die. And the little old lady down front, she said, hey, amen. He said, now, if you smoke those cigarettes, you're doomed to die. And the little old lady, she said, hey, amen. He said, now, if you chew tobacco... She said, look at that, he's done stopped preaching and gone to meddling. <laughs> so I'm going to go to meddling. You know, the truth hurts us, but the truth will set us free. Never forget that. I'm the oldest of five children. And I learned last night that Irene and I were born in the same hospital. Different dates, of course. And the hospital isn't there anymore. But at least we got a chance to get born there. In the Cumberland Hospital in Brooklyn. That's where I was born. And uh, oldest of five children, Jeanette, I haven't gone out and got you a new story, baby. I'm going to give you the same stuff warmed over. Believe me. And my uh, mom made my first drink at the age of 12 years old. And when I look back, I was a stone alcoholic at 12 years old. I don't know anything ever about social drinking. I don't know ever about crossing any lines. I've seen a hell of a lot of lines, though. So. But I don't know about crossing any of them. And my mom made rice wine from ingredients that she received from the welfare, such as rice and raisins. And she made it in a large crockery. And to show you the difference, my girlfriend Marion was with me. And my mom allowed us to sieve this rice wine through cheesecloth. And the difference was that Marion sieved and sipped two drinks and she went home. But I sieved and sipped. And I sieved and I sipped. And I sipped, and I sipped, and I sipped, and I sipped. And I put on a drunk at 12 that was a drunk. My mother lectured to me all night long. 
I went out in the street the next day shaking my little stuff, telling my friends, whew, what a ball I had. And I'm 12 years old. I don't even remember what the hell happened. And that began to be the pattern of my life. If you didn't drink and get drunk and pass out, you didn't say too much for me. At the age of 14, I began to sell King Kong booze. The man made it in the tub, bathtub next door. And I mean, it was King Kong. It stood you straight and it knocked the hell out of you, too. And I sold it for 40 cents a cream pitcher. Now, someone suggested that I take mayonnaise, olive oil, butter, and cream. You know, line yourself up. You know how they tell you to eat a good meal. Honey, that King Kong was so powerful, it went all through the mayonnaise, the olive oil, the butter, the cream. I stopped taking that sick stuff. And I drank me plenty of booze. I made good money. And at a certain hour, I had to be padlocked into the side room. Now, one night, I'm laying out the window, and I see this sharp dude. Lord have mercy. Woo! He was so sharp, I almost fell out the window. And I saw this roll of money, and I said, oh, there's a live one. You know I was always looking for a live one. I look for the live ones in AA, too. I don't look for no deadheads in AA. No, I don't look for deadheads. I deal with those that are going and doing and giving. Those are the people that I deal with. So I went down, and I latched on to this little dude because he had a roll of money. Got down there and found out it was a $5 bill around a lot of ones. I latched on to him anyway because he's cute. You know, real cute. He started taking me from uptown Manhattan down to the Lower East Side, and I began to hit all these joints so that they could give me a play. At the age of 14, I felt that I was a woman. I'm drinking, I'm partying, I'm hanging out. So I run up to my mom one night, and I said, Mom, would you sign for me to marry this man? He's 10 years older than myself. She said, oh, no, dear. Over my dead body. That man will have you up in the street, and you'll live a terrible life with that man. And I found out something about myself at the age of 14. Don't you ever, but never, tell me what not to do. Don't, don't do that. There's something in my nature when you tell me what I can't do. Look like it makes me want to do it and pay all the prices. I paid a hell of a lot of prices. I stayed in AA because they suggested everything to me. Hey, nobody has ever told me what to do in AA. Thank God for that. So I quit school at 14. I took sleep-in jobs. I was drunk every Thursday and Sunday. The age of 17, I left New York with this very man, determined. The more you preach, the more I'm going to get him. And so I left. And I went to Baltimore, Maryland. The third day of January, 1939, I'm standing in a courthouse being married. And I'm crying my heart out. And the minister stopped the wedding. He says, my dear young lady, would you mind just telling me what you're crying about? I said, at last I got him. Well, I'm going to be honest with every one of you in this auditorium. That was the sorriest day of Mr. Bailey's life when he said I do to Liz Ulrich. Mr. Bailey never stopped crying from January 3rd, 1939, till he went home with the Lord August the 12th, 1986. That was a sorry day for that man. Now, I'm 17, and uh, you could imagine what, I'm 73 now. Could you picture what I was at 17? <laughs> Woo! Woo! I got this marriage license. No more mama. No more neighbors. Nobody's going to tell me how to live. No, 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 no. I ain't got this dude, Lord, and I'm going to tear up New York. My husband came home, and he gave up every liquor joint. He gave up gambling. He gave up hustling. He gave up going to parties, and he sat down. And I became a mental case at the age of 17. Because <laughs> here I am, willing to go, and this cat is sitting. And he sat from January 3rd, 1939, <laughs> until he went home with the Lord, August the 12th, 1986. And, honey, let me tell you, I couldn't take that sitting down. I couldn't take it. And I started nursing my little drink through the week. I look forward to weekend drunks. Now I have to have a drink to wash, to iron, to cook, to talk. Then I began to watch changes come over me. I began to curse. Every word came out of my mouth was a curse word. I watched another change. I began to fight. I began to fight everything and everybody. I watched another change. We can see the changes. I began to leave my house for one day to three weeks at a time. I'm watching me go down. 
Many, many people pull me up on the carpet. Why do you drink the way you do? Why do you act the way you do? You have a beautiful home. I didn't call it a home. It was a house. There was no love there. I had every material thing any woman on this earth would want. Mr. Bailey happened to be a furrier girl. And every time I had a period of dryness, just when I couldn't drink no more, it was coming out of my nose and my ears. I had to lay low. He'd make me another fur coat. I had fur coats like beans. And one year, he made me the most gorgeous leopard coat. Oh, you ever laid your eyes on? He threw a party for the job. He brought that coat home, and he threw it out on my bed. And I looked at that coat, and I hated it. I gave it away. I said he made it so he could spot me anywhere. You know? In sobriety, I wished I had that coat many times. I do. It was so beautiful, drunk. You know, that's another thing I always say today. As long as you stay in the active disease of alcoholism, you can never really see how sick you are. You really have to get sober to see how sick you were. Because nobody could tell you how sick you were till you get sober. And there again, I continued to drink. Now, Mr. Bailey was a non-alcoholic. And I said to him one night, and I think some of you non-alcoholics might have heard this, maybe if you drank with me, I wouldn't want to drink so much and roam. Mr. Bailey went around and got a bottle of Gordon's gin. And we laid up in the TV room. And about 11 o'clock, the bottle got like this. Now, any drunk in here knows what happened to me. I panicked. I panicked. Because that's not going to last me till the morning. And the liquor store is going to close at 12 o'clock. So I took my elbow and I hit him. I said, Daddy, would you run around and get a bottle for me before the liquor store closed? He said, no, Liz, I've had enough. Oh, I wanted to kill him. You know that. I wanted to kill him. You ever see an Indian on a rampage at 2 in the morning? Here I am, up dressed, out zoom. Aren't you afraid to go underneath the Long Island Railroad at 2 in the morning? Well, who the hell was thinking about the railroad? I wasn't thinking about the railroad. I was getting to Sutton's Barn Grill so I could fill the Coca-Cola bottle full and sit there and close up the place. I continued to drink. The word is identification now. Don't compare, but identify. I woke up one morning, and my head was coming off my body. I took Alka-Seltzer. I took aspirin. I took BC's. I put a raw egg in the beer. I'm doing all this kind of stuff to straighten out my head. I couldn't get my head straightened out. I reached over and I grabbed the Bible off my night table. I said, well, I'm going to find the answer in this Bible, how to straighten this rotten, filthy life of mine up. And Mr. Bailey passed my room. Put that Bible down, you hypocrite. Put it down. Twenty minutes to an hour, you'll be so drunk, you'll be slapping one of the kids down. He was right. Nobody but nobody got in the way of me getting a drink. And nobody, but nobody, gets in the way of me staying sober. Same difference. Same difference. I'll walk all over you, around you, and about you, and to you, and I'm gone. I'm gone to get my sobriety. And so he kept his mouth going. And I used to say to him, Daddy, try not to talk to me when I'm coming off a drunk. Or, oh, Daddy, please don't try to say too much of it to me if I'm drinking, you know. And Daddy wouldn't keep his mouth shut. And he kept his mouth going. He said, you'll be hopping a cab. And the cab driver said, please take somebody else's cab. <laughs> Took me three days to clean up my cab behind you. Who the hell is he is? I paid 50 cents to get in that cab. Don't tell me who to take. Or I would be swinging a corner. And Mr. Billy kept his mouth going. He kept it going. And I didn't want to hear him. I literally ran and jumped up in the second floor window. This is the first time I ever thought about taking my life. I'm standing directly in this second floor window, and I'm going to throw my body down into the yard, and there's a little lady named Nana Backer. Mr. Bailey! Mr. Bailey! You better get her! She's going to jump! And he comes out this window, the kitchen window. I see his hands come out. He says, Nana, will you let that bitch jump? I'll be rid of all my problems, all my troubles. Let that bitch jump! Well, you know, I looked over at him. I wanted to know who the hell did he think he was. I guarantee every one of you I got down out of that window. I got back in the bed, and I pulled that sheet over and slept that one off. You know, the nerve. The nerve. I continued to drink. I began to hit hospitals. Girls, please don't ever fry a frozen chicken drunk. Don't do that. I hit the grease on and burned up both of my legs. 
And the good sisters, every time you look broken fingers, if you see my arm all sliced up, putting your hands through, total and I didn't have no trouble with the second step when I got here. Believe me, I didn't. And total insane, putting holes in the walls. I don't care what I drank outside. I had to have a cigarette and a can of beer when I got inside, and I'd be in a couch full of fire and all this. And I'll tell you, total insanity, insane. And I remember so clearly, one of my neighbors pulled me up on the carpet. She says, I'm very much ashamed to live next door to somebody like you. I had to get sober to realize that we affect nine people around us. I had a slogan before I got here to each his own. I'm drinking this stuff and you don't want for anything and I'd lay your soul to rest for messing with me. And so she said, and I'm ashamed to live next door to you. I bought this house to get away from people like you. Would you mind telling me what's the matter with you? I said, oh, I suffer with my nerves. And she suggested that I drink rum. Isn't that nice? <laughs> I loved her standing in that little bitty kitchen. I lived in Jamaica, Long Island. I ran around to the Empire Liquor Store and I bought a bottle of rum. I'm still waiting for one of you drunks to tell me how in the hell did I wake up in Brycliffe, New York with the bottle of rum. I don't know. Now, this is identification again. A beautiful lady took me into her home named Wig. And I became a booze fighter in Brycliffe, New York. I put a shot in my coffee. I'd call it Coffee Royal. I'd hide the bottle all day. I don't care where I hid it. I found it. I'd be open and open when the poor soul came home. She didn't know what to do with me. And one night she sat me by the fire. She said, you know, Liz, you're a lovely person. But drinking is your problem. She says, I put my husband out of here for his drinking. And she kept lecturing to me. And now I'm so full of guilt and remorse. Because I'm up someplace that I don't know where I'm at. I'm away from my three children. And I don't know what's happening to me because I can't put this booze down. So I said, well, I'll sit in the Catholic church all day just so I don't touch a drink. Well, I did. I sat in the church till 4 o'clock. I walk out the church and I walk straight into the bar. Identification now. Would you please give me one drink so that I can relax? Not I sat in the church all day, but I need a drink to relax. Because I'm going to peel this lady's potatoes tonight and get her dinner started. Would you give me the second drink, please, so that I can really go get her potatoes started and her dinner ready? The third one they gave free, so you don't walk out on a free drink. That's not nice. That is not nice. I never walked out on a free drink. Then I've got to buy one back to look good. It's very important that I look good. And then when you get to the fourth or the fifth drink, the hell with on her potatoes, baby. Let's roll. So, you know, the lady never got any potatoes from me. You know that. I came back to New York because my little girl wouldn't eat. And Mr. Bailey would always throw me out in brown bags and shopping bags. And now I'm sleeping in an unfinished basement. Don't drink down there. Don't smoke down there. Take care of my children in the day till he let me back in. I continue to watch me go down. I never forget I went out and had a lousy $2 beer drunk. I came in and Mr. Bailey said to me, Oh, look at this. You're drunk again and no dinner. I said, I've told you don't argue with me. I told you to keep quiet. I said, do me a favor. See me up to the bedroom. I remember he walked me three steps. I had a black slack suit on and a gold coat. When I came to, I was stretched out on a bench, a policeman sitting at the foot of me, people walking on the ceiling, my front two teeth doing one of these things, and blood all over me. And it took me three weeks to find out what happened to me. I totally blacked out on that third step going up to my bedroom. And it took me three weeks to find out I tried to kill Mr. Bailey in the blackout. I had smashed up everything in my home, and I had to be bashed in the mouth to knock me out. I had gotten so violent. And the guy standing in the door at the hospital just like this, big guy, I went over to him, and I don't know how I answered the question. But he said to Mr. Bailey, take her home. And when Mr. Bailey, I said to him on the way home, man, don't you lay down. Don't lay down. Please don't lay down. Because I'm going to get you if you lay down for taking me to some hospital. And Mr. Bailey was smart. He sat up in chairs for three nights. He never laid down. And I'm glad he didn't because I might have gotten him because I'm crazy now. And I continued to drink. He came to me one day and he says, Liz, you're the nicest wife when you're sober. Drunk, you're a Jekyll and a Hyde. Why don't you try this AA? 
When you desire a drink, run over to the phone and pick up the phone and call someone to talk you out of the drink. I don't know about Florida, but I know up in New York and going across this country, I don't hear this anymore about telephone therapy. They beat that into me when I got here. Pick up that phone. You might save another person's life on the other end. It's not just your life. It's a we program, not a I, me, my. Well, I'm not going into the flowery words of what I said to Mr. Bailey, because cursing is my character defect, and I really have worked hard on that, not to use profanity. I'm not going to stand up here and tell any of you that I'm perfect, because I can say something nice to you. Would you please move that over there? Monday, right? Tuesday, darling, would you please move that over there? Wednesday, dear, didn't I ask you Monday and Tuesday to move that over there? Thursday, move that so-and-so thing and everything moves. <laughs> and I have to say to my family, I'm out speaking to people all the time. I don't curse nobody to get them to understand me. I don't like doing it in my home. I really don't. But I found out some people don't understand you talking nice to them. They think you're weak, sick, and simple, you know? <laughs> So I just cut them out and go on. Then I ask God to forgive me, you know. I ask him, please forgive me. Well, Mr. Bailey did what Dr. Granite just said to him. I want you to go home and tell Mrs. Bailey. She's either going to drink herself to death. She will drink herself into a mental institution. There were no detox units when I came to AA. There were no halfway homes when I came to AA. We had nothing that you have today. I brought the drunk home with me. I laid he or she on my living room couch, and I took care of you over a weekend and for days to save your job and all that. And then when I saw you on your feet, I drug you to seven meetings a week and three times on Sunday. You were going to get it. <laughs> you were going to get it. And not all of them got it. The only one I've ever kept sober is Liz. I've always been the winner by staying sober myself. And there again, I continued to drink after I cursed him out. And what happened is that I watched me go down. I'm watching me go down. I'm going to tell you about my last drink. I'm drinking with hard, two-fisted drinkers in the VFW Hall on 110th and Merrick Road. I could never stand anybody who took a drink and sipped on it for hours. You got on my last nerve. And I didn't bother with you. I didn't bother with you. See, I wanted somebody that was drinking like I was. And there again, I got a phone call this day from one of the guys in the post. I took and banged the phone up on him. Because there was a lady coming to see me to sell some insurance for the house. I hadn't seen her since I was eight years old. I really wanted to see her, and I know me now. I know me so good that once I pick up a drink, I'm not in the position to tell not one of you in this room what's happening to me behind it. I don't know what's happening to me. I woke up so many different places. I've been beaten to a pulp so many times that I couldn't come out of my own home for two and three weeks at a time. I know what it is to be in the streets of New York. I didn't come into AA through a bedroom. I came in through the streets of New York. And there again, I got the second call from this gentleman. And I said, man, don't bug me. Leave me alone. There's a lady coming, and I really want to stay here and see her today. This is my last drink I'm telling you about. I banged the phone up on him the second time. I remember I went around to the store, and I came back. He was on the phone for the third time. He said, Liz, do me a favor. Hop a cab. I'll introduce you to the people. I'll put you back in the cab, and I'll send you home to your company. So I go, oh, jeez, let me get a cab and go over there because he's not going to let me stay in here today. He's going to drive me up a wall. So I go over there, and the bulls start lining up, and the jukebox is going, and I'm singing, you always hurt the one you love. <laughs> The one you don't want to hurt, you know, give me another drink. Smile, if you're happy, give me a drink. Smile. I could sing them old Weeping Harry songs. As I said, I'm 73 and I haven't seen Miss Lindbaum to yet. I woke up in one of my son's twin beds. Please don't ask me how I got in this twin bed, because I can't tell you. At the foot of this bed stood my mom and Mr. Bailey. 
And my mom's got her head going like this, and she's screaming to the rooftop, somebody done done something to her. Somebody done done something to her. And I look over at Mr. Bailey, and he's got his head going. And he's saying, no, Mom, no, Mom, nobody's done anything to her. She happens to be a very sick girl. <gasps> he didn't call me bitch. You know my name was bitch, right? He, he said I was a sick girl. I got right up out of that bed. I went to the basement of the house, and I stayed in the basement two days praying to die. I wanted out. And I looked up my oldest son, 12 years old, sitting there reading a book. And this is how I spoke to Richard. I said, Richard, I can't live like this. This is not the way I want to live. Look at this. You can't depend on me for anything. And I started to scream, and, oh, God, oh, God, please help me. I've never screamed to God so as I did the second night in that basement. And God answers you. So something said to me, just as clear as I'm speaking to you, try this AA that your father has told me about. I took the telephone book down off the closet, called AA, and they didn't have anyone to send me. Intergroup was at 28th Street and Lexington Avenue, one flight up over a bar. I got there and I said, the hell with AA. Then I said, no, you've taken the bus, the subway, you've run a couple of blocks, try to get up there again. I got into the middle of the landing. Whew, and if you don't call this a higher power, what is it? Because as I went to turn to go down into the bar, a lady looked down the stairs at me and she says, are you having trouble? I said, yes, ma'am. And I went running up the stairs to her. She escorted me in the front part of the office and she introduced herself to me and she started to tell me about her life. <gasps> oh, my God. Who talks about themselves like this? My mother says, put it in a rug, under the rug, in a closet, open up a drawer, shove it in there. Don't you dare go out and tell anybody where you got the black eyes, the busted mouth, or the fights in your house. And I'm listening to this woman, and I'm identifying, and I'm saying, why don't you put this stuff in a garbage can and make sure she got a lid on it, you know? Because I would never tell it before, AA. No way. I didn't have time anyway. But, you know, I was busy out there, honey. I was very busy. And what happened is that she turns to me and she says, it's the first drink. I says, oh, come on, sweetie, I've been drinking for 19 years. She said, Liz, when you pick up one drink of any type of alcohol, even down to cough medicine, it is only a matter of time that a compulsion sets up into you that you have to go all the way. Woo! I see myself take two drinks on a Monday, great. Two lousy drinks on a Tuesday, you're looking for me. Wednesday, I'd go to Gert's department store, I'd buy a fifth. I drank the whole fifth and nothing happened. Went back there Thursday and bought me another bottle. Friday, I'm knitting without needles. Have any of you knitted without needles? <laughs> but Friday, I'm walking up and down and I'm knitting. And I've got to go get that drink to get me back in focus. And she said, we do it five minutes, ten minutes, one hour. One day at a time. We do it with meetings, 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 meetings. We do it with a sponsor. When I came to AA, there was 150,000 members. There are two and a half million members today, and don't not one of you tell me you can't find a sponsor out of two and a half million. <laughs> I don't want to hear that. Yeah. Because it's a we program. You cannot do this alone. I don't care who you are. I've never seen it done alone. It's done with a we. We can do together what I could never do alone. So true. And then she says, you want to go to South Jamaica or Jamaica? And I chose South Jamaica. I don't know about you girls, but my hair stayed drunk. I never could keep my hair nice. Mr. Bailey would give me money for clothes, and I never looked too tough because I wanted to drink up the money. I'm going to my first AA meeting, and I get my hair done nicely, and I buy a little two-piece blue suit, and I go to my first AA meeting, and there's two girls behind the coffee counter, and they look up at me and said, you don't look like an alcoholic. I said, what the hell did I get myself into? Let me get the hell out of here. 
And I started running out the room, and we always kept two people at the door when I came to AA, you know. Yeah. Because, like I said, this was the last resort. And as I'm going out the door, this man hits me over here on the shoulder, and he says to me, what's the matter with you? Where are you going? I said, those girls said I don't look like an alcoholic. I don't know what an alcoholic looks like. I'm about to lose my mind. This is just how I did it. I'm about to lose my mind, my home, my children, and everything through drinking. He said, have a seat, sweetie. You in the right place. They put two tables together that night, and they all sat around, and they shared their strength and their hope and their experience. It is but for the grace of God. Whew. But for the grace of God. Alcoholics Anonymous. Al-Anon. al Alatot. O-A. G-A. P-A. N-A. E-A. F-A. The only A I haven't spoken at is Sex Anonymous. And I refuse to go to Seattle, Washington to put my sex life on tape. How about that? (laughs) You know, to come across this United States, and I have a family. Just July the 11th, I came into AA July the 11th, 1952. And July the 11th, 1994, I just celebrated 42 years away from my last (laughs) friend. And I want every one of you to remember that I'm not cured. I am definitely not cured. The progression of alcoholism is still going on inside of me. If I pick up one drink, I would go up like paper. Zoom. You see? But it wouldn't be the drink to kill me. It would be the guilt and the remorse that would kill me. I know where the answer lies for 42 years is sitting in a room for one lousy hour or an hour and a half and no dues or fees. And back in New York, I'd give them hell. Because you know why? I never had a car in my whole sobriety. And every night a different dude picks me up, you know, and we got that instant love. And my neighbor said, oh my God, from a drunk to this, what is she putting down? <laughs> oh, I still upset my neighbors. And I don't tell them what I'm putting down, but I know what I'm putting down. Because I must never forget the day that I didn't know what I was putting down. Didn't know. And they told me to get sober for myself. Not for my mother. If I had to stay sober for my mother, I'd have been drunk, drunk, drunk. My mother did not like me telling you I was an alcoholic. It took my mother 29 and a half years to tell me to stay with them A's, whatever they are. See, and I don't plan to leave these A's. I know. I know about these A's. Mr. Bailey couldn't stand me sober. Mr. Bailey took my first ten years, and I mean he worked overtime to get me back into the streets of New York. But I thank God you didn't tell me to get sober for Mr. Bailey. Thirty-two years ago, I had the honor and privilege of speaking for our late co-founder, Bill Wilson, at the Hotel Commodore to 2,700 people that night. Mr. Bailey shook my hand and said I did a good job, but when we arrived back at the house, he banged and he screamed that he had to get rid of me, that he couldn't stand me in this sobriety another minute. And I used the third and the eleventh step at three o'clock in the morning, and God spoke to me like I'm speaking to you. If I pick up one drink, I don't have Liz. When I pick up one drink, I don't have Mr. Bailey, and I didn't have him anyway. And when I pick up one drink, I'm not in that house. See, my friends take a drink and go home. I take a drink, I leave home. See, I don't stay. So I know me. I know me. Know me very good. And there again, I went back eight years ago to take care of Mr. Bailey in his last days because I want to tell you something. Many years I stood on these platforms and told you how much I loved him. I really did love him. You know why? He kept the house while I was in the street. He kept the three children going while I was in the street. He kept everything going. He could have cashed it all in. But you know what, girls? I'm back in that home today. And what's so nice is paid for. (laughs) But I was so happy that I could go and make his last days happy. I have some good news for you. I have an oldest son who has hated my guts for 41 years of my sobriety. And he let me know that under no uncertain terms would he ever forgive me or forget me. 
And I had to come into AA to learn how to forgive myself because I was ignorant as far as alcohol and alcoholism. you got to remember 42 years ago, nobody was talking about alcoholism and drugs the way they're doing today in many years. And I found a God in AA. It took me five years. And I found a God that has forgiven Liz Bailey 70 times seven. So any man, any woman, any child that wants to hold my past over my head, I've got to let it be their problem. It is not mine. And I keep love and prayers in my heart. February 14th last year, just coming out of my ninth operation, I've been cut to pieces nine times in 41 years. God keeps bringing me back. And he keeps bringing me back stronger every time. And all through these rooms, there's power in this room tonight. The theme that we have this week, the spirit, it's here. Whether you like it or not, it's here. Because we're all sitting here under the common cause of cleaning up our lives to live better lives. Where there's two or more, he's in the midst of you, whether you like it or not. And he'll do for you what you can't do for yourself. If you keep coming in these rooms, you've messed yourself up when you cross this door still. You'll never drink and drug in peace again. <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen it happen. You can't do it. You walked into the power. He tells you the power is within you in 11 steps. It's within you to keep your life straight. And there again, I'm happy my son Richie is now speaking to me. But it took 41 years. Don't give up before the miracle. Don't give up. Just keep loving your heart for them. God does the work, not you. You ever notice what your self will do? Nothing. It cause you trouble. But if you do that 11th step, he says, you start through prayer and meditation to have a conscious contact with your higher power, praying only for his will. His will. Because my self will kept me in trouble. And the power is within me to carry out his will, not Liz's. Again, I had a beautiful son named Dennis who was an alcoholic and an addict. And I used to say to Dennis, the right road may be hard, but you'll be the winner. The easy road, the price is heavy. 24 years ago, June 25th, my son was shot and killed. My father hung himself while I was sober. Oh, you're going to be tested in sobriety, sweetie. Oh, yes. I'm living here to tell you, you're going to be tested. But if you pass those tests that are given to you in this life, he's got something good for you. He's got something good for you. Yes, wait patiently. You'll see. And there again, Dennis was shot and killed. My father hung himself. My sister went into Manhattan and jumped 30 floors. Isn't it wonderful I didn't have to pick up a drink about any of that? I used to drink for everything. Drink for every reason. I didn't have to do that here. And I didn't do it alone. I did it with many beautiful people. Dolly is even one of them. Don. They were always with me, right with me, through it all. You don't have to do anything alone anymore. In fact, you don't have to drink anymore or drug anymore. There's too much help out here today. Too many places that you can find yourself. I have a beautiful daughter. I stopped drinking when she was five. I thank God today she doesn't remember me as an active drunk. So she would use my drinking to hurt herself a little bit more. And she'll look at me today and she says, I can't be like you, mother. I don't ask anybody to be like me. Be yourself. To thine own self be true. She's just coming out of her sixth mental breakdown. I've had six horrible months past. But you know what I know? I got the message. This too shall pass. It's not going to stay this way. I'm not going to stay this way because I'm suffering under her. I'm going on the 7th of September for consultation so that I can learn how to live with a mentally ill daughter. I do not know how to live with my mentally ill daughter. I've been using the AA principles on her, and it's working because she acts like a drunk most of the time. <laughs> she acts just like a pure drunk. A slickness, you know, I say she's sick and slick, you know. And, I, and I'm right ready for her slickness, too, you know. And I've been dealing with drunks a long time, and I'm one myself. I have a beautiful AA baby named Adrian Anita. I named her after AA. She's 38 years old. She's had 12 children. She's got six living. So it makes me have 12 grandchildren that I see by appointment only. 
And I want you to believe that. I don't do no babysitting. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No. No. Mm-mm. I do not do no babysitting. No. I've raised my children. I'm not raising any adults anymore. I'm not raising them. I have two great grands that I never dreamt that I would have and one grand nephew. I've had a fantastic life in Alcoholics Anonymous. I've gone up and had three operations in six weeks. The doctor said, you have cancer. He says, I'm going to give you six months to live. I said, please don't talk to me like that. I'm in a fellowship that teaches me I live one day at a time. I'm now 27 years an arrested cancer patient, and my motor's running fine. Again, I'm telling you, you're sitting in the most powerful fellowship in the world. I had a heart attack. I had my throat cut from ear to ear. They took two glands out. I couldn't speak. I said, okay, Lord, you threw with me speaking? It's all right. He's not through with me. He brought me back more powerful. I have to stand up here and say, cool it. I've seen you come up half the chairs with the power that's within me come out. I've seen it. Last year, I was cut open and closed back. I've never seen anybody closed, open and closed back to tell you about it. And I called the nurse in the room one night and I said, I want to make a confession to you. What is it, Miss Bailey? I said, I feel like I'm dying. And I want to make a confession to you that I have tried to live a good life. I really tried to live this good life. And I believe in God. Oh, Miss Bailey, you don't tell God when to take you. He know when to take you. I said, let me shut up with this woman, you know. <laughs> she said, good morning, Miss Bailey. How are you? I said, you know, I seem to die in the night, but I sure come alive in the day. One of my friends coming out from work had a pocket full of money. And the guy said to him, stick him up. He said, man, don't you see I got a disease? And the guy ran from him. <laughs> he said, Liz, he didn't even wait for me to tell him I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and I cracked up on that one myself. I went to the kitchen floor. Because I hated that word disease when I got here. I say, Mr. Daddy, what am I going to tell my friends when they ask me to have a drink? He said, tell them you got a disease. I said, like hell, I'm walking around telling people I got a disease. And I looked it up in my dictionary, and it says, dis at ease with oneself. I readily tell you, I have the disease of alcoholism. I love each one of you. I've made amends to my loved ones, thank God. There's only one person in 42 years I haven't made amends to, and that's my bartender. I owe him two dollars. He'll never get it. I sent his chil- I sent his children to college. Yes, I did. I bought that man a new Cadillac every year. I sat there and watched it go up and down Jamaica Avenue. And I just want to take one of you to Vermont and show you the house I bought him. It would injure me to give him the two dollars. And the place closed down when I stopped drinking. It hasn't been there in 42 years. It's an athletic club. You see, so who are you supporting and killing yourself? You got to think about that. And I think about that. And I thank God for each one of you. Let's have a beautiful weekend, huh? Set it up to be good. Because, see, I do that at 10434 199th Street, Hollis. When I walk out that door, I'm going to Tampa. Woo! And I'm going to have me a natural good time. And I do have a good time. I don't know what's going on around me because I'm having a good time. You know? And I do feel so honored and privileged of being with you this weekend. God is good all the time. God is good all the time. And you know he's good every time I'm hitting these planes and trains and buses and subways. When I get back in my house, I almost want to kiss them dirty floors. Woo! You got me making it again, I tell him. You got me making it again. And he does. And it's no secret what God can do. What he does for others, he can do for you. With his arms wide open, he'll carry you through. Please believe it. I live it. I don't just talk it. And I live it, and it's wonderful. And, of course, I want to say this to the committee. Thank you again for all the work that you put in this year. These places, conventions, take a year or more to put together. It's a lot of work. How about let's give them a round of applause? I have
have a primary purpose, and my purpose is to stay sober. And every time I'm allowed to share, I pray very hard that I reach just one of you. My daughter will say to you, oh, there she goes to save the world. No, I'm not looking to save the world. I just want to touch one, that you'll stay here. And for my friends who travel so many miles today to be here tonight with me, oh, God, I love you. I do. I just love you. Because you just keep showing me that I'm not doing it alone. I'm doing it with a higher power that took me 20 years to put him first. Seek God first in his kingdom and his righteousness. It has nothing to do with religion. It's strictly spiritual. Because we have a spiritual sickness, whether you like it or not. And if you can put God first, then all things will be added unto you. And again, if I've touched just one tonight, then I, Liz Bailey, I have not lived in vain. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Please support the channel by liking and subscribing.